Hi everyone, this lesson's on bacteria and viruses. So let's start with bacteria. Bacteria are prokaryotes and they're found in two of the three domains or the largest categories of life on earth. These two domains are domain bacteria, used to be called domain U bacteria. These are more modern bacteria, the kind that would infect you, you'd find on most surfaces. They're also found in domain RK bacteria. Domain RK bacteria are found in extreme environments like underwater oceanic vents and in hot springs or very salty or acidic environments. These are the oldest bacteria. Bacteria can live everywhere. They are found in every ecosystem on Earth. They're found on plants and animals. They're found in plants and animals. They're found in the soil and they're found in the depths of the ocean, especially at oceanic vents that have a lot of nutrients for them to utilize. They can be found in extreme cold and in extreme hot, such as hot springs. They're also found in extreme salt. With salt beds, anywhere where there's high salinity, we found bacteria. We found them on the living and on the dead. They are unbelievably versatile. And because of their ability to live in extreme environments, this is why people who think about life on other planets, astrobiologists, like to look at RK bacteria to determine what kind of signals we should be looking for for life on other planets. They have tremendous diversity in their structure. You can see here some are pill shaped, circle shaped, spiral shaped. There's a shape. Bacteria have probably evolved to have it. Let's look in their structure in a little more detail. Prokaryotic cells are unicellular, and the three most common shapes are bacilli, cocci, and spirilli. Bacilli are the pill shaped bacteria, cocci are the spherical, and spirilli are spirals. They are tiny. They're about one-tenth the size of a eukaryotic cell, averaging about one micron across. If we're going to compare a bacteria to a eukaryotic cell, you can see here, very, very small. This is why many prokaryotes can live on top of eukaryotic organisms or inside them. Their internal structure is very simple. They have no internal compartments like that of a eukaryote, and that's why they have no membrane-bound organelles. Looking inside of a prokaryote, You'll find some cytosol, some DNA, and some ribosomes. That's about it. Their DNA is unique as well. For a eukaryote, our DNA is highly condensed around structures called histones and nucleosomes. But for a prokaryote, it's a naked chromosome. There is no wrapping around histones or nucleosomes. Their cell structure is also pretty unique in terms of the cell wall particularly comparing them to plant cells. On the top right here, you can see the results of a very common bacterial test called a gram stain. It turns some bacteria pink and others purple. Let's see why. Gram-positive bacteria turn purple because they're able to absorb a gram stain, and that gram stain attaches to a structure called peptioglycan. Peptioglycan is found on the outer portion of the cell wall for many bacteria. It's made of polysaccharides and amino acids. This is different than bacteria that we call gram-negative. Notice that they're pink. This is because they don't absorb that much of the gram stain. Why? Well, on top of their layer of peptioglycan, they have an outer membrane of lipopolysaccharides. These lipopolysaccharides are made up of lipids and polysaccharides. So why do we care if a bacteria is gram-positive or gram-negative? Well, it relates to your health. Most antibiotics that you would take to destroy bacteria if you're infected work by destroying peptioglycan, causing the bacteria to leak out their contents and die. Well, gram-negative bacteria have that outer layer of lipopolysaccharides, which prevents that antibiotic from working effectively. It's good for your doctor to know if you're infected with gram-positive or gram-negative bacteria, because typical antibiotic will work on gram-positive, not going to work on gram-negative. Bacteria are not only diverse in their structure, but also in their metabolism. Let's look at some ways that bacteria get their energy and nutrients. Some are photoautotrophic, meaning that they're photosynthetic. They're able to undergo a photosynthesis-like process to get carbon from the atmosphere and utilize that to obtain energy. Other bacteria are chemoautotrophs. Chemoautotrophs are able to directly oxidize organic comp inorganic compounds, such as nitrogen, sulfur, and hydrogen. These are the kind of bacteria that you find in a hot spring or in an underwater vent. And then there are bacteria that are like you and I. They're heterotrophic. They have to consume other organisms, plants or animals, to get their energy. They can do this by consuming them when they're alive or by being a decomposer and consuming dead or decaying matter. All of this is because bacteria have tremendous genetic diversity. 
and it's caused by a variety of mechanisms. One is mutations. A bacterium can reproduce once every 20 minutes. That's pretty fast. And there's an error that's going to happen whenever DNA is replicated. It happens in you, it happens in bacteria. Mistakes occur. Because they reproduce so rapidly and because there is going to be a mutation during DNA replication, about one in every 200 bacteria have a mutation. Bacteria can also reproduce by a process called binary fission. Binary fission is pretty straightforward. The bacteria doubles in sizes and splits. Anytime this happens, there's going to be DNA replication, which can cause a mutation. Two other ways they can increase genetic diversity is by genetic recombination. They're able to actually take DNA from outside themselves and express it. One way is to uptake a plasmid. Bacteria have small circles of DNA called plasmid outside of their central chromosome. These can be uptake from the environment and expressed, creating more genetic diversity. Another way is something called conjugation. Bacteria are able to form a structure called a pili, attach it to another bacteria, and use it as a highway for directly transferring DNA. Bacteria, as you know, can be pathogenic, meaning making an organism sick. They can be disease-causing microbes. They do this in one of two ways, either by eating the host or by releasing a toxin that causes the host to become ill. They are notorious for causing plant diseases like wilts, fruit rot, and blights. You can see some of that destruction in the plants here. And for causing animal diseases, things like tooth decay and ulcers. Your entire digestive tract is lined with bacteria, and if the wrong kind gets in there, it can be detrimental to your health. Also, anthrax and botulism. These are two examples of bacteria that release toxins that make you sick. Botulism is notoriously famous because that is the main ingredient in Botox. The botulism toxin causes paralysis. So what we've done is put into syringes and injected into people's faces to make wrinkles seem less prominent. There's also plague, leprosy, flesh eating disease, many STIs, sexually transmitted diseases, just as such as gonorrhea and chlamydia, Typhoid and cholera occur when you have bacteria in waterways that are not being treated, and TB and pneumonia, Lyme disease as well, are caused by bacteria. But bacteria aren't all bad, they're also very good and beneficial. Life is dependent on bacteria on Earth, primarily because they're the primary decomposer. All living things die, and they, that, those dead bodies need to be broken down and those nutrients need to be recycled so that life can begin anew. Bacteria are the primary decomposer for that process. They're also the only ones that can take nitrogen from the atmosphere and fix it into a solid for all other organisms to use. All of life depends on nitrogen to build proteins. Problem is, animals and plants can't get it from the atmosphere. So bacteria called nitrogen-fixing bacteria take that nitrogen gas, fix it into solid molecules, which plants can then uptake through their roots and you obtain through the plant. They also help living things digest. If you're an herbivore, you can't directly digest the cellulose in plant walls on your own. You need bacteria in your stomachs to help you break it down. It's too sturdy of a molecule. By those bacteria having that action, the cellulose is broken down to a small enough molecular level for the herbivore to be able to extract energy from it. This is also how vitamins like potassium and B12 are obtainable for humans. Bacteria need to be able to extract that from plants because our digestive systems can't do it on their own. They're also used to produce foods and medicine, everything from yogurt to genetically modified bacteria making insulin for people with diabetes. So let's look now at a virus. What is it? Well, the question of if it's even a living thing is still open. You've learned earlier that living things are defined by having criteria like being a cell, having a metabolism. Viruses don't meet all those criteria. So let's look at what they do satisfy. They do have a genetic material. Viruses are going to be made of either DNA or RNA encased in a protein coat. But they're not cells. They're not the smallest unit of life. They're also extremely tiny. You can see in this picture here, scaling a eukaryote, a prokaryote, and a virus. A virus is tiny to even a prokaryote, which itself is unbelievably small. Let's look at the particulars of a virus's structure. There's two main parts. The outermost portion is called a capsid, sometimes called the viral envelope. This is an outer protein coat, and the shape of that coat varies based on the type of virus. You can see on the right a tobacco mosaic virus and an adenovirus, 
completely different structures, and that determines what they can infect, especially the glycoproteins on the outside of their capsid. These glycoproteins are going to need to interact with the surface of whatever cell they're infecting. If the shape fits from the glycoprotein onto the cell it's infecting, the virus will be allowed in and will replicate. But if the glycoprotein can't stick to a different type of cell, it won't infect it. This is what gives viruses their specificity and determines how you react to them and what organisms they infect. Influenza, its glycoproteins can attach to the lungs in mammals like humans, but also other animals like dogs. Compare that to a bacteriophage, completely different looking capsid. A bacteriophage will only infect bacteria. It can't attach to any of the eukaryotic cells that make you up because there is a glycoprotein mismatch. And the genetic material inside a virus can come in two varieties. It can be double or single-stranded DNA, or it can be double or single-stranded RNA, and we call those viruses retroviruses. Here's the generalized life cycle of a virus, or how it reproduces. Unlike prokaryotes that can reproduce asexually and eukaryotes that can have their cells reproduce asexually, but as organisms can reproduce sexually, viruses don't sexually reproduce at all. Instead, they're going to enter a cell, the cell that they're infecting, and they're going to inject their DNA or RNA into the host cell. That's then going to be assimilated into the machinery of the cell. Reminder of the central dogma, DNA goes to, pro, goes to RNA, goes to protein. They're going to hijack protein synthesis and cause your cell to read the viral DNA. That will then be transcribed and translated into viral parts, into capsids, and more genetic material. That'll be assembled in the cell, and this will continue again and again and again until the cell lyses from how many viruses have been assembled. Those will then exit the cell, go out, and infect other cells, propagating the virus's numbers. There are two specific ways a virus can reproduce. One way is called the lytic cycle, and it's just like I demonstrated to you. Virus comes in, integrates its DNA, it's used to synthesize viral parts, and then the cell lyses, it repeats again. Another way is the lysogenic cycle. With the lysogenic cycle, DNA is integrated into the cell's genome and isn't transcribed. The cell reproduces generation after generation, and each time carries a copy of that viral information until something triggers the cell to enter the lytic cycle. So here's the lytic cycle in more detail. You can see here a phase is inserting its DNA into an E. coli. That DNA is then read and used to build different components of the phage, the head, the tail, collectively the capsid, and the fibers that help it attach. That will continue until the cell lyses. And now that one virus that started this, there's now five escaping, going on to infect five new cells. This can happen with upwards to 100 to 200 phases in reality. Lysogenic cycle is a little different. These are things that stick around during the lifetime of whatever is infected. Think herpes. Here the virus is able to integrate its DNA and it doesn't immediately synthesize. Instead, one cell turns to two, two turns to four, four turns to eight. These cells will remain dormant until some kind of stress. To put it in human perspectives, that could be a temperature change, it could be psychological stress, not doing well on an exam, worried about something coming up, will then trigger these cells to read the viral genome, which will cause now, instead of just one cell making viruses, hundreds, all making viruses at once, which then lice and propagate the cycle forward. RNA viruses are a little different than DNA viruses. What they have to accomplish is a way to get that RNA into DNA. Let me explain that another way. If a virus is made of DNA, it can inject its DNA and that DNA readily goes through the central dogma, DNA to RNA to protein. If I inject RNA into a cell, I've got a problem. I need DNA to begin protein synthesis, not RNA. So to overcome this problem, there's an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. It takes transcription in reverse. This enzyme is going to take the viral RNA from the retrovirus, convert it to DNA. That DNA can then go through protein synthesis to go DNA to RNA to protein. This is just an extra step that RNA viruses have to undergo in order to reproduce. A great example of this is HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. This is a retrovirus. You can see in this diagram, it injects its RNA, reverse transcriptase then converts that into DNA, which is then read through protein synthesis to make more viruses. So thinking about diseases that affect us like HIV, 
what part of the cycle could we potentially manipulate to try to have a treatment? Well, target the reverse transcriptase. If we can block reverse transcriptase, that'll reduce the virus's ability to reproduce. And if the virus's ability, if virus's numbers stay low, then the body isn't going to be under as much of a tremendous attack from the virus. And this is exactly what contemporary HIV treatments do. They attack the reverse transcriptase, and we've gotten so good at these therapies that there are individuals who've been infected with HIV, but we've kept the viral count so low because the virus can't reproduce, that we refer to them as being undetectable, meaning that the viral count's so low that a test that normally picks up the presence in large numbers can't. Some more facts about viruses. Viruses typically remain within one species, viruses like polio and measles. And vaccines are the most effective treatment we have for them. We don't have many treatments to help when you're infected, but we have great treatments with vaccines to prevent you from getting infected in the first place. You just present someone with some antigens in their bloodstream, their immune system learns how to attack before they encounter the actual virus. But a virus can jump from species to species. If the conditions are right for the virus to mutate, a virus such as Ebola mutated from bats and made its way into humans, and COVID-19, current research suggests that it came from a pangolin and mutated to be able to then infect humans. If you're infected with a virus, the symptoms can vary dramatically based on what kind of a virus you're infected with and the health of your immune system. Typically, you're gonna get symptoms like a fever, aching, potentially some bleeding, that is your body trying to fight off the virus. Some components of the virus itself can be toxic, such as the viral envelope proteins, and that's part of the reason why your body responds this way. In terms of the damage that you'll experience from a virus, it depends on the virus you're being infected by. If you're infected with something like an influenza, the damage that's done to the lysine of your lung cells can be repaired. Your body can rebuild those cells. But if you were to damage a cell that can't reproduce, such as a nerve cell or a heart cell, with the case of polio, it's the nervous system, that damage is permanent because your body can't repair the cells destroyed by the virus. So we've looked at bacteria and viruses. Let's now look at prions. A prion is a protein that acts as an infectious agent. These are proteins that have been misfolded but are able to replicate and infect. They form clumps and holes around nervous tissue, which can lead the organism to experience mad-like symptoms and ultimately die. A great example of this was mad cow disease that affected portions of the UK. Prions are exceptionally rare, but it is something I want you to be aware of. So we've looked at bacteria and viruses. We've seen the structure and function of both. I hope this was helpful in your understanding of both of these, particularly because these both have importance in biotechnology. With biotechnology, bacteria are very commonly used for genetic engineering because of how simple they are and how quickly they reproduce. And viruses have the unique ability to target only a specific cell with their glycoproteins and insert a genome. That can be very helpful for the advent of new gene therapies. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.